Our next speaker is the one of the finalists for the Global Teacher Prize. He claims that we need resources to pass on healthy doses of skepticism to our students. And now he's here to talk to us. He, you are a teacher at the uh, bilingual Montessori School of Lund, exactly right? Yes. So the floor is yours, Philippe Longchamp. Thank you very much. Dear fellow teachers of the world, today I stand in front of you to suggest that critical thinking might be the most important 21st century skill for us to teach. A recent study by PISA showed that only 47% of 15-year-olds in the OECD countries are able to tell the difference between facts and opinions. I would argue that the development of critical thinking might be as important as literacy and numeracy in this age of information. This is why critical thinking urgently needs to become the cornerstone of everything we teach in school. But how can we reach this goal together? Well, first of all, let's start by teaching our students to identify and trust reliable sources. Then provide them with plenty of examples of logical fallacies, cognitive biases, and make everyone aware of the Dunning-Kruger effect. We must empower our students by giving them a habit of fact-checking. Challenge them to debunk false assumptions and pseudoscience on their own. Teachers should not hesitate to play the role of someone believing strange conspiracy theories in order to reinforce their students' logic and reasoning. And but because if their answers come from within, it will make their learning experience much more sustainable. Debunking unfounded claims will become a self-acquired lifelong skill. This is exactly why I invite you all today, together with your students, to join me in this global effort to eradicate online disinformation at the source by using hashtag keep it real. But how is this going to work? Well, as soon as you or your students are skeptical about anything you see posted online, simply use the hashtag keep it real and you will invite an expanding global community to participate in the fact-checking process. Let us launch a global effort and make this into an evolving, democratic and organic movement. Hopefully, this will eventually create herd immunity against gullibility. <laughs> Together, we can raise an army of critical thinkers by gathering potentially harmful disinformation under this hashtag. We will be able to create a lockdown on viral disinformation and prevent it from spreading. But unfortunately, too many people have already been contaminated by countless conspiracy theories. And there is an urgent need to vaccinate the youth against viral disinformation. I mean, we should at least give them jabs of healthy skepticism while they're still in school. This might be the only way to guarantee that the next generations will be equipped with the right tools to be able to take decisive actions to solve real-world problems founded on evidence-based information instead of wasting our precious time on made-up issues. We can even train very young children to recognize misleading clickbait. For example, they can quickly learn to identify Photoshop pictures such as these when searching for the word tsunami. We must inspire the youth to value the scientific method, and to quote a young and courageous Swedish activist, we all need to unite behind the science. 
By using hashtag keep it real, we teachers can also consciously avoid using the term fake news because it's been hijacked and misused by some disingenuous people. So to make things right, we should use the term disinformation, malinformation, and misinformation, and explain their differences to our students. Of course, this is not meant to be targeting things that are inoffensive. There's still room for humor, wonderment, and imagination. So I'd like to clench this wonderful opportunity here at the Nobel Prize Teachers Summit to initiate this call for action to all the teachers of the world. We will need the support of a wider community of experts, as well as policymakers and NGOs such as UNESCO, the Nobel, and the Varki Foundation. But most importantly, we need to support each other. Together, we can build this movement, and this will not happen by itself. Teachers will need appropriate training to do this, but it is possible, and we need to do this together. We can bring a new hope for a healthier information ecosystem, and it starts today. My name is Philippe Longchamp, and I would like to conclude by saying what I say to all my students at the end of every class. Keep it real. Merci beaucoup. Thank you so much, Philippe. That was really inspiring. Thanks, Mika. Everybody Thanks. should be a teacher after hearing you. <laughs> so uh, I think we actually have a video question from Eric Wu in China, who works with kids with special needs. So let's listen to Eric. Thank you. Hi, this is Eric from China. I guess my situation might be a little bit different from the others. Part of my job is related to the kids with intellectual disability, and we're trying our best to teach them, but once they graduate, they're going to be very vulnerable to the complex society filled with a huge amount of information. So, Mr. Vida, may I ask your opinions on teaching strategies under such a situation? Thank you. Yes, students with disabilities are definitely swimming in the flood of facts. Yes. So, Philip, what do you say about that? But I think here in Sweden, we're pretty good at doing what we call unpassing. So we try to adapt our teaching style to the needs of our students. They all start at different levels. So I think that when they're exposed to so much information online, regardless of their abilities, we teachers have this responsibility to be able to sort out what is reliable mm. and to teach them. I think there are tricks, like the example I gave with some easy pictures. You start early, you try to develop their, their uh, skepticism, but a healthy one. Mm. We don't want to have teenagers who are cynical and see everything, that they reject everything as soon as they are exposed to a news. We need to have people who are able to sort out what is most likely. Mm. Thank you so much, Philippe Longchamp, and we will see more of you in the panel at the end. Thank so you. this was a flood of inspiration. This week, outstanding achievements have been awarded the new Nobel Prizes of 2021. By doing so, we allow them to see their differences, their diversity, and different perspective as well. In addition to that, it caused students to embrace tolerance, um, not only embrace tolerance, but see the beauty of their own culture and racial diversity versus analyze it. And um, th therefore, by doing so, we help the students to prepare for the world to be a global conscious citizen. That's good, really. So, uh, do you have something to uh, to uh, to say about that as well, Philip? Yes, I, I agree with my counterparts from all over the world here. Um, this tolerance, uh, actually, our job is also to promote peace and understanding. So we need to establish this dialogue, regardless of the opinions of our students. We need to encourage them to explore each other's opinion, but. Our role as teachers is probably to use a Socratic approach and ask questions, but we need to be able to ask the right kind of questions in order to make these conversations 
fruitful and to lead somewhere. So um, we can also remind our students that everyone can be prone uh, to confirmation bias, even those who are on the right side. Okay, thank you, Flip. So and also, how do teachers deliver this right and positive messages to students when free expression is being suppressed by more and more governments? Thank you. So, uh, he passed on this question to you, Vidar Helgesson. So, you can start by just answering a little bit what you think. And since I've been urged to stay very, very brief, I'll just very refer to all the excellent introductions we've had today, because they do provide most of the answers. <laughs> Very wise answer. <laughs> so uh, I, I want to pass it on to, to Philippe Longchamp, which is the teacher here in the panel. I, I totally agree as well. And I, when I have these types of questions, I usually love to quote one of my hero, Carl Sagan, and he said that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So encourage the students to search for their answers by themselves, but with the teacher's guidance. This is very important. So I, I was looking at Annika Rabo when Philip was talking and you were like, <sighs> what was your reaction? Well, my reaction, of course, is that we should trust the, the young generation and we should be very humble and, again, emphasizing the need to be curious about the world. And I think this meeting of together over, over generations in a classroom, but also outside, this is really what we, what we yeah. have to do all over the world. So uh, I think we still have uh, Saul Perlmutter with us. What's your take on this? Well, I, I do think that part of our job is to immunize uh, the students um, ahead of time by, uh, by teaching many of these different elements that people have been talking about today and that I was describing um, as a, just approach to day-to-day um, -day life so that they um, recognize that they can use these techniques all the time so that when they see it in these uh, you know, dramatic other forms, they, they recognize the problem with it. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's really good point. And Pontus, do we have any more questions from the teachers from the chat? Yes, we have. We have uh, a couple of questions, but I will start with this one. It's relating a little bit to what we discussed earlier with the, the other teachers, but uh, we didn't get to that. But we have a lot of very interesting and good speakers to, to think about this. How can school leadership support classroom teachers in their teaching of controversial issues? What can you do as a school leader? Wow, I was a school leader before. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I should ask, answer this, no. But I, I want to pass it on to maybe to Åsa. What can leadership mean? for addressing this question. Wow, okay, so I'm a <laughs> philosopher, <laughs> uh, yeah. but I do talk a lot about, I guess two things, I think it is extremely important to support the teachers in the classroom mm. to find uh, their the way that they think works mm. to use these, for example, uh, teach the scientific method in this mm. sort of way that we were heard about before. Um, and also, I think really to teach the students, uh, one thing that was emphasized before was uh, the fact that we can be wrong. Mm. <laughs> That's a really important thing. Um, and that uh, is connected to teaching uh, humility, epistemic humility, as we say in philosophy. Mm -hmm. That is to say, you, you may be very convinced, but you do have to listen to, listen to objections. Mm. However, that you can be wrong is not in itself an objection to anything. Mm. <laughs> so uh, you need then to provide reasons as well. Mm -hmm. So support the teachers to find the best way to, to apply these sort of methods. If it's uh, in the classroom or having uh, s school conferences, that can be a good thing bring in scientists and all those things. Mm -hmm. yeah, but also, I, I think to be a role model and also as a leader show that you can be wrong and you can also like think twice and uh, learn more. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think, w do we have another question from? Uh, we have one here. Uh, social networks are largely, largely responsible for the dissemination of fake news and disinformation, um, but we know. <laughs> I've been listening to Andreas Lorhammer, uh, Andreas Anfors as well, and he talks about the history of fake news. But largely nowadays, uh, you've been all talking about it. It's a big issue. Do you think we should ban them, the social, net so yeah. social networks? Okay, uh, first I will ask you, Andreas, sure. with the short, and then I'll pass over the 
word to Don Larhammar. So. Oh, of course, I think we cannot ban any uh, n media of uh, knowledge exchange, as bad that knowledge is, which forms the basis of the conversation. I think the best thing is to provide teachers with tools, understanding what a conspiracy narrative, for instance, is. So understanding it is a narrative that has a dramaturgical structure with those 12 elements I was talking about before. And once you have decoded that, you can address that not simply as a matter of false information, but as something else that plays an important role in the pupils' or students' lives mm. and their way of trying to make sense of the world. Mm. So, uh, Don Larhammar, uh, I know that you have been teaching uh, when we were talking about other things, but uh, do you want to add something to the panel questions? Well, I, let me first uh, say that I totally agree with Andreas. I think we cannot ban and should not ban the social media. What we can do is increase people's awareness of when our thinking goes wrong. And I think what all of the presentations have been showing is that there is so much exciting psychology behind all of this. So if we could teach psychology at a very early age in our schools, I think we would make everyone better equipped to deal with the world and deal with themselves. So psychology for, for nine, 10 year olds, that's what I would envision. Uh, very wise, I think. and. Uh, Actually, I will, I will end with you, Saul. Uh, you are a Nobel Prize laureate. What do you think teachers means to the future? What is the impact of teachers? Short. I mean, I, 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 as we're watching you know, these, these uh, current crises, as, as we're saying that this problem of having people be able to work together and think through problems together um, is the solution, it, it seems obvious to me that it's the teachers who are, are the, the ones who are going to have to save the day, um, that if we are able to generate a generation of, of students who understand these issues in a, in a more deep way, I'm, 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 I'm much more confident. And so that's, I'm looking to the group here to solve the problem. <laughs> so thank you so much. We have these fantastic speakers that we have heard today. We heard Nobel Prize laureates, Sal Perlmutter, Don Larhammar, Åsa Wikfors, Andreas Önnerfors, uh, uh, Vidar Helgesen, Annika Rabo, Philip Longchamp and my fellow uh, teachers at the museum, Pontus Thunblad and Anna Olander. So thank you so much for joining us today. We have been talking about how to teach in the flood of facts and what teachers can mean actually for orientating in this very complex and sometimes very polarized world as we are trying out new things because the Nobel Prize is all about trying out new things, new ideas, creativity and making the world better. We also are trying out hubs for the Nobel Prize Teacher Summit. So this year we actually had over 50 groups of teachers in different parts of the world, watching together, discussing this program. And uh, now we also invite those of you who are inside the web platform, you can go to the breakout rooms because there we will keep on discussing. And to all of you who are watching, please join us the next time for our online seminars. And also please come to Stockholm and the Nobel Prize Museum. So thank you so much for the work you are doing as teachers. We can't value you enough. So thank you for today. Goodbye.